everyone to this session on uh, graphic novels and, and comics. Um, please, if you have a cell phone, uh, put it on the side or, or by break. Um, the festival would like you to fill out your commentary cards at the end of the, the session, and there are pencils on the table um, out there if you didn't already get one, and you can, you can drop those off uh, at that point. Um, one of our uh, presentations, just a little short point where someone's going to going to read from some of his comics, um, has some adult language. I should do it more at a time. So when the when the tall guy gets up, um, you know you should know that's when that's coming. Um, so let me tell you a little bit about our um, our panel. Uh, Peter Cooper uh, is the co-founder of the political graphics magazine World War III Illustrated, which is in its 31st year of publication. He has written and drawn Spy vs. Spy in every issue of Mad Magazine since 1997. Uh, Cooper produced over 20 books, including The System, Sticks and Stones, uh, Diario um, de la Haca, and um, an adaptation of Franz Kafka's The Metamorphosis. He has been teaching comics courses for over 25 years in New York and is a visiting professor at Harvard University. Uh, Mr. Cooper is sponsored by Henderson State University. David Reese first came to fame as the author of Get Your War On, a Bush-era comic strip composed from clip art that he faxed to friends. It was eventually serialized by Rolling Stone magazine, collected into three successful books, and turned into an off-Broadway play. He is also the author of the workplace satire, My New Filing Technique is Unstoppable. Um, he lives in Beacon, New York. Uh, his new work is How to Sharpen Pencils, a practical and theoretical treatise on the artisanal craft of pencil sharpening. Um, and he has a, a session later today, I believe, which uh, he'll be talking more about that, that book. Um, Barbara Slate's You Can Do a Graphic Novel is uh, used at all levels of classroom education. Her first cartoon character, Miss Liz, appeared on millions of green cards in a regular comic strip in Cosmopolitan magazine and as a star in a series of animated segments on NBC's Today Show. Slate created Angel Love for DC Comics, wrote and drew Yuppies from Hell and Sweet Sixteen for Marvel, and put her own spin on Disney classics Beauty and the Beast and Pocahontas, as well as Mattel's Barbie. She has written over a hundred Betty and Veronica stories for Archie Comics. Her art has been exhibited in many galleries, reviewed by the New York Times, and profiled in A Century of Women Cartoonists. She is currently busy being a mom doing a graphic novel entitled um, Getting Married and Other Mistakes, and teaching teams to create graphic novels. And she has a session later today, I think at noon, where she's going to focus more on, on the, her book that uh, helps teach uh, how to do a graphic novel. Lila Quintero uh, Weaver was born in Argentina. She grew up in Alabama in an immigrant family that encouraged her artistic interests. She holds a degree from the University of Alabama, uh, and the graphic novel Darkroom, a memoir in black and white, is her first published work. I'm going to open up a presentation here for uh, Peter Cooper and turn it over to him to give you a little bit of a brief uh, background on kind of what he does to show you some images that we can refer to later in our discussions. Here. Thank you for coming. Um, so I just I thought I'd show a couple of um, uh, in influences. Uh, early one being Mad Magazine. The thing that struck me about Mad was you just never knew which direction they were going to go, and that uh, even the fact that they called the artists the usual gang of idiots always impressed me. Uh, then came the underground comics. Um, I also was a superhero comic reader um, in the in the uh, '60s and '70s. By the time I was ready to get into comics, that pretty much gone away. Um, but in the meantime, they were, they were a big influence on the kind of things that interested me. Even though they had the uh, sex and drugs aspect of it, they also had politics in there. This is another big influence. Um, I don't know if you, if you don't remember uh, Ronald Reagan. He may not remember either. Yeah. He promises a less bureaucratic shadow government. Um, this influenced me and my friend um, to start a magazine when we were in art school called World War III Illustrated because the idea that um, somebody like Ronald Reagan was going to end up in the Cold War going up against uh, Brezhnev and the, just the, the 
the, the vibe in the country at that time was definitely headed towards war. And so we, we started talking about these sort of world issues, but very quickly realized that what we were talking about, we were just reading about in the papers. And so we started talking about things that were closer to home, like you know what was going on on our block in Manhattan. And it kept on being, the, there kept on being issues, unfortunately, to talk about. And more and more people joined us in the process of doing the magazine. And so over the years now, we're now in our, I think, even 32nd year, um, we keep doing new issues and uh, um, addressing what's going on and continuing the idea of, of um, alternative media. Um, this will also give me an opportunity to work with other people in kind of a community situation where I can develop my comics. And um, when I had the opportunity, I did an adaptation of Upton Sinclair's The Jungle. And I wanted to demonstrate different ways that you could do comics and, and for that matter, my general interest in the form and how it could be um, used and the, not, not only stylistically directions that you could go, but also most particularly the subject matter. And I certainly found that the personal was political as well. And there's a little <laughs> view of my brain. <laughs> uh, and I got the opportunity to work with DC Comics. They asked me if I had a project, and I presented this. A, I thought I would. I wanted I had a very long story, but I decided I would do it as a wordless story because most people think. Comics are supposed to have word balloons, they're supposed to have panel borders, they're supposed to be done in pen and ink style. And I decided to try to throw much of that out and then tell a story uh, that was about interconnected lives and how, um, you know, the, what, and life in New York and a combination of things. Uh, Mad Magazine saw that I was doing uh, this wordless comic and it just happened that they were about to um, change up artists because the uh, the creator of Spy vs. Spy was retiring. Um, and I'm really interested in general in the language of comics even. You know, the idea that a sawing log represents snoring, or in this case, a weapon. And, and you have those painting stars which, if pl properly applied, can be throwing stars. And if you get in trouble, you can always use your word balloon too. <laughs> and the symbol, you know, that and you know, this is the kind of thing cartoonists came up with these images, and I'm I'm just utilizing them. And so the light bulb is an idea. I have an idea, and the idea is that I will throw my light bulb at you. <laughs> and if all else fails, move the panel border. Uh, I also uh, did an adaptation of um, Kafka's Metamorphosis. And um, this was another opportunity to bring audience who didn't necessarily read comics to the forum because they might know Metamorphosis, but then the idea of what you could do with comics in that was uh, not necessarily something that, that uh, people would have seen. And, it, and I thought it, it worked well. The humor that's in Kafka, even as dark as it is, um, came through, I think, in, in using this medium. Now, right outside Gregor Sampson's window on September 11th, uh, was, well, from my studio, I could see the, uh, the smoke rising from the Twin Towers. And this was a point where I was both, um, I, I wished that the comics could do more, but I was also relieved that we had a publication that we were doing that wasn't dependent on mainstream media. And it was really a point, though, where I wish art could do more. I felt like I was trying to tell these stories and have some impact, and there was nothing I could do to stop what happened. But curiously, my daughter's art came to my rescue in a certain way because I'd come home at the end of the day and then we would sit and draw together and I could forget about the woes of the world and get in her world. Um, this is the cover of the issue um, that we did right before we went into Iraq. And we talked about the fact that we thought it was a bad idea. Um, not that that stopped anything from happening, but they, that that was a time when we could not, in mainstream media, you could not talk about these things. And at that point, people like Art Spiegelman, who did Mouse, were finding their way to World War III to get published. And so he's, he did a book called In the Shadow of No Towers, which first was running in World War III. Um, <laughs> this gave me the opportunity also to go back to my roots. One of my first jobs was inking Richie Rich, and I, and I did this um, parody for that. Uh, I got very tired after years and years of doing um, things about Bush, and I wanted to talk in a broader sense about what it meant to um, you know, power and where it came from. And so I thought, like, where does somebody like 
you know, a president like that come from? And I thought maybe he gets spit out of a volcano <laughs> and self-actualizes. <laughs> and for some crazy reason, we give him power and he's more than happy to take it. It ends up being kind of a biblical story and things don't end well for our anti-hero. So after the uh, second election, <laughs> as it were, um, a discussion I was having with my wife about taking a uh, sabbatical and moving to another place for a little bit seemed to be appropriate. Um, we picked this town called Oaxaca in Mexico, and I thought it would be an opportunity to get exposure to other kinds of art. There's a radishes that people carve. Um, and we first arrived there, and I noticed there's a lot of graffiti on the wall, and I had not done my homework. And, uh, um, Is that two minutes or two seconds? <laughs> um, <laughs> and, I, and so, and I, I did not speak Spanish much at the time, but the taxi driver suggested there was something with the governor, and um, I learned very quickly that there was a teacher strike that was going on there. But it, was, it had been going on every year for the last 25 years. They had a, they'd have this teacher strike. It would last a couple of weeks. They'd go home. Um, and uh, it was a pity, though. I really wish that I could read what, what the people were writing on the streets. Actually, I could read that. Um, <laughs> truth be known, we never got anything but a warm welcome when we were there. Uh, and I did have the opportunity to draw things that weren't just political. But very quickly, I started noting this teacher strike and seeing what was going on with it and applying my art once again in that direction. And uh, when an American journalist was killed down there, um, along with many, many other locals, um, federal troops were set in, sent in. Um, some very enterprising women wrote murderers on their shields. And I kept waiting for them to rearrange the shields so it would say, like, have a nice day. <laughs> but just the idea that somebody come up and write you know, and it, it, the, I have a, an image of the two women that were doing it. Um, there's my wife walking around one of the barricades, and uh, they had written murders on the floor there. So I discovered very quickly there's my daughter. I asked, I asked, is that okay? Yes, go ahead. And I found myself turning towards doing images about the strike. I also got to see how art was applied, and uh, this is from Day of the Dead. People. Everybody seems to be an artist there, and it's not exclusive to artists versus you know the viewing public. And this is some of the art that they used during the strike. And there was like a dialogue going on. You'd see that there's what you know people kind of talking to each other, and then the government also talking back. It was their response. <coughs> and this just made me want to use my art once again and to kind of send messages. And I got uh, sent it to publications around the world, and illustrated things like an article about the journalists who've been killed. This is uh, the drawing I did the day it turned out was the end of the strike. And just a, I walked away, and moments later, um, the police attacked. And I finished the drawing back at home looking at photos on the internet. And this is a piece I did for World War III. So I came back from there. I'm still processing what happened, even though it's, it's about three or so years ago. But I did realize just how small the world is and how connected we all are and what happens in Mexico or in the Arctic happens in Manhattan and that uh, it's one round world and do I worry? Well, yes. <laughs> but these leaders turn to dust and are replaced by new leaders with new problems and I, you know, you can't help but realize that uh, our leaders are only going to get us so far and it's going to be very much in our hands to figure out what we're going to do to uh, repair the various damage that has been done. And, uh, but alongside that, as history has been a lesson, there's art there that will uh, be part of the charge and uh, part of the flag that people can hold. And that um, although uh, that says that the uh, revolution will not be televised, I do believe that it will be illustrated. Thank you. Be the uh, adult portion of our program for uh, just a couple of minutes, so if anyone feels like they might be uncomfortable with that. Um, but um, in addition to making um, comics, um, David Reeves is a uh, performance artist uh, as well, so he kind of has to add to uh, what he's given. And you can't really understand the, uh, the magnitude of his artistic talent anyway without seeing some of his uh, cartoons projected. Okay. Uh, all right. Uh, so
So these two guys on the front row, we're good? Yeah? F word okay? Yeah. <laughs> All right. Down to the down here. Okay. So um, I grew up making cartoons and drawing and stuff, and then I realized after years and years that I hated the process of, of uh, penciling the cartoon and then inking it. And also, I was a horrible drawer, so I kind of gave it up until I had a temp job. This is years and years ago now, but I had a temp job with nothing to do. I was sitting around goofing with PowerPoint, and I realized that you could uh, just import clip art and build cartoons that way. And so I have proud to say I haven't really drawn a proper like, cartoon character in like 15 years. <laughs> and I encourage anybody cartoonist in the audience to throw away their pens and pencils and just use clip art. Like, Bill Gates already drew everything that he needs. <laughs> <laughs> Cartoons. Uh, so the first cartoon that I made using clip art is called Mighty Fighting Technique is Unstoppable. This is just karate <clears throat> clip art I found. This karate temple sure keeps us busy. God damn. Damn, I love keeping ambulance drivers busy. I haven't seen the inside of an ambulance in a long time. What the fuck? I'd like to show you the inside of an ambulance. Ha, huh, I think I'll show the inside of an ambulance to you instead. So what do you think of the inside of our ambulance? <laughs> Probably the greatest thing I've ever made. <laughs> it really did help pass the time at this time. And then I moved on to my new filing technique is unstoppable. <laughs> when will the 10K 2G files be ready for review? Uh, I have no idea what you're talking about. Come on, the 10K 2G files. We need them in order to calculate the F3 index code. Ooh, that sounds cool. Can I help? Hell yes, you can help. Actually, it's your job. Great, I'll use my computer. Oh man, I feel like I'm about to get really sad about what I'm doing with my life. Not me, I have a computer. I mean, it's just silly, okay? I, I admit that. Did you install the new 23KL filing protocol? I tried, but it didn't work. What the hell? Get it done. Yo, check your vibe. It's too aggro. What's aggro? Why are you always using all these weird words? Oh man, I can't handle all your questions. I gotta lie down. You better get used to my questions, buddy. I have lots of them. Um, are you interested in having a marijuana smoking contest? So, yeah. Um, <laughs> I was kind of just doing this stuff, and then, uh, as Peter mentioned, uh, we, I was living in New York during uh, the 9-11 attacks, and obviously it was really traumatic and stressful. And uh, I had a lot of, like, uh, I guess I had a lot of like pent up emotion or just like churning emotion and, and anxieties, obviously, and questions about what was going to happen next. And so one night, all this stuff was weighing heavily on my mind. This was like three or four weeks after the initial attacks. And uh, I kind of felt like, I mean, to be fair, it was like a month later, but I, I was feeling skeptical of this rhetoric of a war on terror. It just sounded like really expensive and it was going to take a really long time. And uh, so I decided to use this stuff, like the clip art and the bad language and everything, to make jokes about the war on terror. And so that's what led to this comic that I made called Get Your War On. So this was the first one that I made. It was really simple. Oh yeah, Operation Enduring Freedom is in the house. Oh yeah, Operation Enduring Our Freedom is in the motherfucking house. Yes, Operation Enduring Our Freedom to bomb the living fuck out of you is in the house. Not super subtle, not super literary, uh, not super interesting to look at, but that was kind of the point. I wanted to make something that looked really boring, like those old like Rex Morgan MD comics. You know when you're a kid and you're like reading the comic pages and there are all these boring soap opera comics for grown-ups and it's like, it's just two people standing around going, yes, Mary Worth, I'm going to bring a casserole to your party. Great, I can't wait to see you. Will Brad be there? I hope so. I'm in love with him. And when you're a kid, it's like, you just want to read Garfield or whatever. I mean. So I was trying to like make something that was that boring, and then when you would read it, it would have this kind of like shocking language. Oh my God, this war on terrorism is going to rule. I can't wait until the war is over and there's no more terrorism. <laughs> I know. Remember when the U.S. had a drug problem and then we declared a war on 
drugs, and now you can't buy drugs anymore. It'll be just like that. <laughs> right, God, if only that war on drugs hadn't been so effective, I could really use some fucking marijuana. <laughs> uh, I realize now that's the second marijuana reference in like a minute. <laughs> uh, I'm not going to read this, but I just want to show you that I immediately became intoxicated with the power of word balloons. And it's the kind of balloon I just started like crushing the Poor little clip art characters with my rants. So blah blah blah, all that stuff. Okay. Uh, then I started making a comic for women called Relationships, made for the modern woman, because I can have women what they want. It's primal, authentic, and emotional, and many famous people like it. This is also a chance for me to show off my skills of drawing geometric shapes. Basically, this was a comic about relationships from the point of view of some badass geometric shapes. Her, did you remember to buy tickets to the big flower arrangement convention? Him, ooh, <laughs> says it all, ladies. Uh, it's a great dress, forget I said anything. Don't lie to me, screw you for hating how I look. This is the best one I ever made. Him, I'm chilling on the sofa. <laughs> I made some promotional posters. <laughs> Why do you wash my fancy bras in hot water? They're supposed to be washed in cold water. I don't know. I'm depressed. Uh, a lot of people were confused by this comic, including myself. <laughs> but that's one of the pleasures of cartooning, is you can confuse yourself. And speaking of things that confuse people, this is my latest venture, which isn't really cartoon related, but I want to point it out because my friend made this nice woodcut for my new business uh, of sharpening people's pencils. Thanks, guys. <laughs> Thank you. you can learn more about that pencil sharpening later. Uh, it, it, um, I'll just put an image up there. I don't know if you have any specific images you wanted to, to show or refer to. But, uh, um, um, I know you have some, some hopes you brought also. Okay, you know what? I'll just I'll, I'll go quickly because anybody who's coming to my session at 12, I won't have to hear this twice. So, um, when I moved to upstate New York, which way do I go? This way? Uh, just hit the space bar. Okay. That's I moved, part. Okay. I, when I moved to upstate New York, um, I started writing my uh, Getting Married and Other Mistakes. And um, I was sitting at my drawing board forever, and it just really was going nowhere. It took me 14 years before I got this book published. And it's coming out June, 12, uh, June uh, 2012. So, um, I was sitting at my drawing board and the phone rang and it was a librarian asking me if I was interested in teaching teens how to do graphic novels. And it sounded like a great way of getting out of the house. So I said yes and uh, I said make sure you cap it at 15 because um, I wanted to give special attention to the kids. And uh, the librarian laughed at me and said if we get three teens in our library it will be a miracle. And it was a miracle. We got 15 teens in the library. I had a wonderful class. And basically, I started writing this book because the kids actually taught me how the, their process worked and how they wanted to do the graphic novel. So where do I go here? Uh, and, I, and what it is, it's the adventures of you. Because everybody on this planet is different. Everybody has their own voice. So find your voice. It's always inside of you. Get to know your process. This, um, when I was working for Marvel Comics, I had three books every month to do. And the, uh, the, I realized that my process was that one day a month, I just, my brain just left the studio. There it goes, I'm so out of here. And I'm saying, hey, where do you think you're going? So I learned that part of my process was giving myself that one day of going roller skating, getting out of the studio. So get to know your process and then trust it. Write what you know about. When I was 20, I hopped on the Greyhound bus and came to New York City like many other adventurous girls. But I remember that moment of terror and uh, excitement. And so I can go into that moment in that bus and absolutely write volumes about the feeling that it was for me on the bus. So write what you know about. It. And I, my first comic book was Angel Love for DC Comics. And this was obviously a girl coming to New York City. 
uh, discovering that life is not all that, except, well, it's kind of adventurous. Angel Love is kind of me, but um, much more interesting, I would say. <laughs> and uh, everybody can draw. Stick figures are very exciting. Sometimes stick figures really have the most personality. Uh, if you can't get started, doodle. You know what, I'm just going to go quickly because is everybody coming to my session at 12? You not? Okay, I'll just go very quickly. Draw your characters from the front, back, side. And sometimes characters pop right off the page. Other times they come in your dreams. And as I said, it's really good to write about the one and only you. The good thing about writing about you is that you're cheap and you're always available. <laughs> <laughs> characters are everywhere. Keep your eyes and ears open. Um, this, well, I started doing a comic book called Yuppies from Hell for uh, the um, Marvel Comics. And what I did is I eavesdropped all over the city. And I got all these amazing conversations. Like, can you imagine a guy saying, I think my relationship with what's your name is really getting serious? I mean, how could, how, he doesn't even know her name. And so from that, I got a character that I wrote. His name is Joe. And you can see him running in the park. And that was three issues with this main guy. Of course, his um, relationship was with Jolie, who all she wants is absolute commitment. So you can see the conflict there. And that guy at the bottom right was my psychiatrist, Dr. Graham. <laughs> you can see he's got his bedroom slippers on. Well, actually, not in that one, but that was a, I, I actually based a lot of my characters on real people, because if you have a go-to person and you can get right inside that person's head, it really helps. And this is a plot, uh, no, this is a, um, the Angel of uh, Bible. And the Bible is everything you need to know about your character and more. The name, parents, sister, childhood, their biggest fear, favorite color. So you actually need to get to know your character better than you know yourself. Which for some people is not that difficult. <laughs> And here, nobody likes a boring story. Here are ways you can tell that you're telling a boring story. Ask yourself, would I be excited to read my story? Another way is, if nobody gets your story, it's probably boring. And the third way is, if your mother and girlfriend both love it, it's probably boring. <laughs> <laughs> so um, this is how, this is a beginning, middle, end, and twist, which is um, a guy who can lift the Empire State Building, fly around Earth, and morph into any form, but the only thing he really wants is to be normal. So there you have the beginning, middle, end, and twist. And you should be able to tell your story, even if you're, it's a thousand pages long, you should be able to tell the beginning, middle, end, and twist in three to five sentences. Okay, the plot line shows the evolutions. All its twists and turns, highs and lows, plots and subplots. And this is the plot line. When I did Angel Love, it took me, oh, I guess about 10 times going in, trying to figure out what my plot line was. And finally, they sat me down and told me how to plot. And uh, actually, I have um, some pamphlets I can pass out because it's so important to learn how to plot. And this is all color coding, where you put your main plot line on the top and all your subplots on the bottom. And if you've ever picked up a comic book from Marvel or DC in the fifth issue, and you don't know what the heck is going on. That's because all the subplots have taken over and there's no main plot. And usually what happens is you put that comic down. So every comic, every story has to have a beginning, middle, end, and twist. Um, so this is when I, was, um, when I was a kid. I was the girl who could draw. And, everybody, and I, my, uh, our teacher, Mr. Firestone, gave us all uh, sketchbooks. So we had a, um, a, a, like a three month period of time to fill the sketchbooks. And in those books, I put in uh, you know, all perfect drawings of comics and I copied them from everywhere. And I thought I'd get an A plus, but I got the C minus scribbled across my pictures. And my uh, art teacher said, draw from life. And that was the, one of the most exciting things. And I realized that what happens is, pretend you came from Mars and that you're seeing things as if for the first time. See a tree as if for the first time. See a dog as if for the first time. Look at yourself as if for the first time. 
what happens is you draw what you see, not what you think you see. Because when we get older, we have these ideas and pictures in our mind of what a house looks like, what a dog looks like, what everything looks like. So you don't really look. And when you really look and see what something looks like, it's a completely different drawing. So should we just, yeah. okay. Um, a quick public service announcement before I move to the next part. Someone had asked me about um, development credits. <laughs> school teachers and, and you know, wanting um, a professional development credit. Actually, Barbara's uh, 12 o'clock session on the fourth floor, I think, would be an excellent one for that. Uh, and she probably wouldn't mind signing if people had certificates or something they need sign at that point because she's going to have some resources for teachers and those sorts of things. I, I actually have some teacher's guides that will teach the kids how to do graphic novels through the book. So any teachers here, I'd love to help. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so I thought we could just throw out some questions and, um, and then turn it over to the audience after a little while. But um, I wanted to, to ask um, Leela um, a little bit about her book. She is um, actually sitting in front of um, her graphic novel. And yours is um, very autobiographical. You're, you're the main character for that. Um, why the graphic novel format for that rather than just a prose story? Uh, you know, what led you to that decision? And do you think it was a good decision? Do you think there's something that was gained doing it as a graphic novel? Well, the reason that it was a graphic novel <clears throat> instead of a memoir, and, and text-only memoir, is because, frankly, I think that it would not have been nearly as interesting. I had a story to tell about being an, an immigrant child in Alabama in the 1960s uh, with um, a lot of the components of the civil rights movement because my family lived in the part of the Black Belt region of Alabama, which is most famous for the things that happened in Selma. We lived in a small town about 30 miles away where there were also some significant events that occurred. And uh, a lot has been written about the Civil Rights Movement, but um, not much from the point of view of an immigrant because really there, in that region, there are not a lot of immigrants, even to this day, I think it's it's um, the case. So we had a unique point of view, and because of the fact that I do have a drawing background, it was just a, a natural vehicle for me to express what was in my heart to say, the story that I had to tell, and obviously people were more interested in it, frankly, not, not just my point of view as a Hispanic in a uh, state where in the 1960s, being Hispanic was really rare. So, um, well, I've got a few questions I'm going to just throw out to the panel in general, and um, you know, trying to be concise because we want to save time for the audience to, to ask some more interesting questions than I come up with. But um, when you're doing autobiographical work um, and you're you're thinking about, you know, um, how am I coming across in this? What are people going to think of me? You know, if you're a character in it. Do you, do you have that thought process, or do you are you able to get some emotional distance and treat the you in the story as just another character? Anybody want to talk about their experiences with that? Um, I know if I'm deeply embarrassed that I'm on the right track. <laughs> <laughs> so I've been, and I mean, I finished autobiographical stories and sent them off, and then thought, what have I done? And that, I assume I'm, I'm doing something right then. <laughs> I base my characters on real people that I know. For instance, my ex-husband is probably going to murder me mm. <laughs> because I'm doing the book Getting Married and Other Mistakes. Um, it's so close to him, um, and the, the character is very close to me. And it took me so long because it was so emotional. But, you know, I just really delved into um, all the mistakes I made because I didn't follow my own voice. And uh, so when my publisher called it uh, a biography, I said, no, don't call it a biography, because um, I did change a lot of it, but I, I really didn't, I wanted to have it out when people came up and said, that's not me, and I said, no, no, that's not really you. Anything that you can tell us about that? Oh, well, I would never make a comment about this. <laughs> <laughs> he's, he's actually clip art guy number four. <laughs> 
I was at a conference recently, and a woman who had just bought my book and read it the night before, and she said to me, I know all about you now, and you know nothing about me. And, and I said, well, that reminds me of the relationship that women have with their gynecologists. <laughs> 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 Now, what about the decision about how to draw yourself? Uh, you know, um, Lila and Barbara are fairly, fairly attractive in their comics and in real life. Um, but uh, Peter, you, you're not all that kind to yourself. Um, you're not as bad as Joe Sacco. Uh, I don't know if anybody's read Joe Sacco's thing, but he, you know, he really, <laughs> even as he drew other people more, more realistic, he made himself more cartoony and exaggerated. Why, how, how do you come up with, this is how I'm going to draw myself? I, you know, actually, I just drew myself the way I see myself, and uh, it's it's also probably growing up on mad and the whole usual gang of idiots idea. It's you always do better if you. I mean, if, if you ever try to make yourself look better, you look worse. So I might as well just you know draw what I see and uh, hope for the best that way. And Barbara, did you take your own advice and look in the mirror the first time you're going to draw a picture of yourself in a book? Uh, <coughs> You know, I decided just to go with a cartoon. Anytime somebody says, can I have a portrait of you, I just send a cartoon. Yeah, I, when I turned 35, I just sent cartoons. That was it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm ageless now. Okay. Well, I did tell my sister about this. She'll love it. Um, one of the other things I do is a little exercise, and it's the most extreme navel gazing I could possibly do. It's, um, I keep a, a sketchbook that's all self-portraits, and I, I use it kind of like a diary. And I try and do it in different styles and, and you know and do it as sometimes it's just an emotional picture and sometimes it, you know it's just making fun of myself or or I try to draw it accurately and all those kind of come together like pixie does when I have to draw myself in a comic. Now what about with family and friends? Do you run things by them as you're doing the work or do you just kind of hope for the best when they see the finished work? How how do you negotiate that? My biggest credit is my 15-year-old daughter who comes in and lays it out for me. So she, I don't even invite her in. She just comes into my studio. So I have, I have a, a real critic. And of course, editors are wonderful. You know, if you, if, you're, if you have the opportunity to work with a good editor, there's nothing like a good editor. Send thing off and you can get something, some real feedback. I never, I never recall having an editor be very involved in the process, besides maybe my wife saying, you made me look fat. <laughs> <laughs> it's like it's in her arm out a little bit or something like that. But um, I, I change the names of most of the characters besides myself right. and, and sometimes even myself. I mean, I consider it more of an autobiography than <laughs> <laughs> So are you the spy or the spy? <laughs> <laughs> I'm the loser. <laughs> he wears black more often, so I think he's got a, he's got a side. Yeah. Yeah. It's um, more graphic. Yeah. Yeah. Now, now, Leela, um, I know you said your your siblings were supportive of the work, but did they kind of see things as you went along, and did you get any feedback from them? I didn't give them kind of a continuous update, but I interviewed my siblings kind of to refresh my memory on events, to corroborate stories, and also to hear some certain stories that especially my oldest sister, who's 11 years older than I, and had actually an eyewitness point of view on certain things that uh, I wrote about. So that was that was something I felt I really owed to them, and my parents were both deceased, so uh, unfortunately, a lot of uh, data perished with them. Did you, did you siblings get into any fights recalling things differently? Um, no, it, we kind of, at, toward the end, I sent everybody an email and I said, okay, look, pretty soon it's going to come out and you need to understand certain things about the process of creating a narrative and that is that you have to oversimplify, you have to streamline, you have sometimes you have to kind of, I don't know, make things look slightly different than they actually did and then I think everybody you know, understood or at least so far so good. Nobody, that's, that's good. I, I still don't have the nerve to send my mother the new book. <laughs> she's, she's not going to like the way she's portrayed. <laughs> now, for those of you who have done um, cartooning that's been more political in nature, um, you know, by its nature, cartooning uh, simplifies and exaggerates. Um, and is that, a, is that a problem when you're 
dealing with complex political issues? I mean, does cartooning have the same problem reads, you know, say the media has in general, it's just glossing over and, and distorting complex issues, or is there a way to make that work in your in your favor? David, you distort complex issues. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, that's an interesting question. I mean, I think when I started the political comic, all I wanted to do was kind of push back against the overwhelming media narrative at that point. Um, and, I, and the reason I made the comic is because I just wanted to make, I can't remember if I mentioned this when I was up there, but my goal was to make the comic that I wish I could open up and read in a newspaper at that time. So it was kind of like a, the point of the comic was to be kind of like a really emotional and forceful like push back against a lot of the stuff that was coming out of the White House. And it wasn't the most nuanced, complex thing uh, initially, but that, yeah, that was the point. I wanted it to be a little more kind of just like an emotional response. And that's how people took it. I mean, they, you know, other than getting some really angry emails uh, from people, the other emails I got were people just saying that they didn't know anybody else out there was having the same concerns or worries or anxieties that they were. And that the comment was really cathartic to them. Now, a lot of the humor of what you did, you know, could have been in just script format. Of Ed says this and Bob replies that. What What do you feel you gained by combining those words with the pictures and putting them in panels? Well, because people know intuitively how to read a comic, and people assume and when they see a comic form that it's not going to demand too much of their time. Those comics were just made for myself and my friends initially, and they spread around the internet. I think the reason they spread at least at the beginning, was because, yeah, it's like a three-panel cartoon. Everybody know, recognizes that form from newspaper comics, and everybody knows that they'll be done reading it in two seconds. So the goal was just to have those two seconds be pretty, like, uh, powerful. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. yeah. So, yeah. That original question. I, I worked for the original yeah. question. <laughs> Why do you lie in your comics? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 Well, I guess it's a general question about is, is the comics form even suitable for complex you know, ideas, or does it oh. simplify and distort just because it's cartoony? Or? No, I mean, I, I think that it, that it, it uh, has the, uh, one of the great qualities of it is the way it sneaks up on people. And that you'll read, you'll, you may, you know, the uh, cartoons Thomas Nast at the turn of the century was was doing drawings of this political figure, Boss Tweed. And Boss Tweed said, you know, I can deal with all everything that they write about me, but it's those damn pictures that I can't, my constituency doesn't read, but they, they look. And in fact, the image he drew of, of Boss Tweed ended up um, helping to identify him when he fled the country and and, and it landed him in jail and and he died penniless. Woohoo! So, um, so uh, um, I, you know, I, I just think, I think it's a perfect, vehicle for um, showing things and, and also the possibility of con contrasting words and the pictures so that you have, you know, like as, as Dave is doing, where you show an image that these guys that you recognize as being sort of these 70s clip art people, but then what they're saying is so outrageous and that blows it up even more. So I think that there's some very unique things that you can do with comics that you can't do in any other medium. And there is, there is a tradition and it's really strong now of serious comic-based journalism, like Joe Sacco is someone that you mentioned, and he's done really serious comics about different international com conflicts that are complex and nuanced, and the art just adds another area, or your book about a walk. I mean, there's a lot of that kind of stuff. One of the, one of the first uh, bits of comic scholarship um, was a guy named Randall Harrison, who um, published a book based on his doctoral dissertation called um, Cartoons, Communication to the Quick. And the quick is, you know, it happens quickly, but also like we cut everybody out of the quick, and you know, it hurts, it has an effect. Uh, and so, um, what are some of those things? I mean, you, I know you've talked a little bit about that, but anybody else want to talk about, you know, what is it that makes um, the form so powerful for communicating ideas? I, I think everything is so fast today. And uh, I, I started out doing greeting cards, and I remember I would go into a store and watch people go to a greeting card. I had about a half a second to get that person's attention. It really comes, there's so much coming at you that to read a comic is really like reading a book. 
and you just really, you can tell, you get the message really quickly. And I think people really don't have that much time today. There's too much going on. So I think it's a wonderful forum, and I'm so happy that it's actually, that graphic novels are actually being sought after today. I mean, after I've done so many comic books, and it's amazing that now it's, uh, it's, it's such a popular form. It was, it was so grand in the 50s. Everything that was wrong with the youth of today was because of those damn comic books. And now uh, I, I went to a school, and the principal is giving out comic books for these reluctant readers to read. And I said to her, you know, I'm a, I'm a little bit nervous about these violent comics. She goes, I could care less. She goes, I just want the kids to read. So it's really become a, a great form. Well, I mean, what's ironic is it's an incredibly complex set of information that you you may need to have in order to read a comic. They're also very accessible. But there's a, you know, a kid reading a comic is putting together, like uh, connecting the dots from panel to panel. And there's all sorts of things that your brain is doing in order to do that and figure out what's going on. And you're just looking at maybe two pages when you open a comic. And, and the artist has to figure out how to get you to look in the order that they want, and it's a it's a very interactive form. You know, you go to a movie and you sit there, and it kind of washes over you. But with a comic, there's all these this activity that goes on. And so it's so ironic to me that people are talking about it for years as not being an art form or being a lower art form or all all, all that. And you know, not even having to defend it. It's just like it always struck me as being very complex and and really you know it needing to, you need to draw upon a lot of your abilities. You know, both visual reading and sequential thinking and and for the artist it, it, you have to be a letterer I mean if you're going to do the whole thing you're going to, you have to have a complex set of uh, abilities in order to pull it off and, and so they, that I've always been so amazed and kind of bemused by people being like oh or, you know I don't read comics that you know those are for kids or you know some incredibly dismissive attitude about something it's like wow it's it's really difficult to do them and they're very complex and so the hell with you then <laughs> <laughs> well, let's, uh, let's open it up to the uh, audience for some questions. Um, I have two questions. One, uh, I was wondering who the audience is today for bad actors. Um, I mean, I remember being 13 and having to you know, read it kind of off the side. You know, it was a little... Racing? Yeah. Uh, and the other question I was wondering if uh, your, your work is done without about captions, about any kind of conversations, or do you worry about it being possibly misinterpreted by some people, you know, one way, or rather misinterpreted from the way that you uh, created it? That um, well, to answer the last question first, I, I mean, that's my job. It's like I have to figure out how to make it, you read sequentially and go where I want you to and understand what the images mean and all that. And that, uh, um, you know, I, I apparently have figured out how to do that, and I, sh I sometimes show it to people, and I'm not sure. And if they don't get it, then I have to rework it. Um, Matt did some kind of survey, and I think that their audience is around. It's like college age to 24 is is it a big group, and I think women read Matt. And it's, I always thought of it as being younger, but um, apparently it's actually skewed older than uh, at least that's the demographics that I came up with. Yeah. Um, I got a question for David, actually. Um, so in the last year or so, yeah, the Rage comics, I don't know if you're familiar with those. It's like a, it's kind of like a clip art comic where they use these really crude drawings and yeah. they all kind of follow a similar pattern. Um, I, just, I was just curious what you thought about this because there's all of these generators available now where people can just go and pull all of this art and create their own comic in a few minutes and then post it to Facebook. I think it's great. Um, yeah, I think anything... Any tool like that, and obviously the modern computer and the internet, and like um, it's the same thing as like an image macro. You know, I think that's the term for it, where you take a photograph and type text on it and make a joke, and then these things go on Facebook, you know, and on social media. I'm in favor of all that stuff. I mean, I'm sure that in 30 years I'll realize that nobody there's nobody left on earth who can actually draw. And that will be sad. <laughs> but uh, it will be your fault. It will be my legacy. 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 It will be my legacy.
he doesn't really want you to throw away your pencils because if you did that, you wouldn't need to sharpen them. Yeah, I'm, I'm walking a fine line here. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah very fine line. Um, but I, I love all that stuff. I mean, anything that makes it easier for, I mean, it's very intimidating because like the, the internet's democratizing momentum in terms of content creation helps content creators who are paid to do it realize they're no better than anybody else. I mean, there's so much funny stuff on the internet that's just made by random people using a tool set that they didn't even necessarily design themselves. That is to say, using another bit of, uh, you know, using like clip art or using a pre-existing comic that they, I mean, this is how I started, was just like whiting out Mary Worth Blooms and writing obnoxious jokes. I mean, there's a whole tradition of that, and that's easier than ever now on the internet. But I think it's great. It's intimidating, but it's great. It's kind of like sampling. Yeah, of course. Yeah. yeah, I mean, it's the same thing. And I, what, I, I'm a huge fan of hip hop, and I love great. I love it when a sample makes you hear the original song in a new way, or when the sample is taken out of context and put in a new song that creates a completely different mood. To me, that's like so exciting. And that's one of the appeals for me of using the clip art is grabbing images from all over the place and then just making them do things that they probably would never intend. When you guys are starting a new project, do you start with words or images? Uh, well, I mean, if it's a wordless piece, <laughs> well, actually, I, I usually start with words. I mean, it's, I would make note of the idea, and uh, I, I carry a little uh, notebook around with me because I, I see like ideas as disappearing, like dreams. You know, you wake up from a really solid dream, and then you, you know. If you don't tell somebody to write it down, then it's gone by the end of the day, and or, or by the end of the hour. Um, and so I'll start by just making note of things. But uh, this uh, Sticks and Stones, which was a 128-page book, I was watching a movie, and uh, they they just said something in the movie, and I went scribble, scribble, rock turns into king, and empire crumbles. And I found it in my notebook about four months later when I was unemployed, as one often is as a freelancer. And, uh, and just said, oh, right, that, and started doing it, and it ended up being this six-month project. And so, but yes, words first, and story first, too, also. You know, the, the idea is, is the big thing. I think the, the worst thing that happens in comics is that people put a lot of energy into doing a lot of fancy art around an idiotic story. <laughs> That's the thing with comic books. It takes six people to do a comic book. So you really have your division of labor. And uh, everybody has to really do a great job, otherwise you don't want to even look at it. But it does start with the writer in comics. But if you really want to get into a fight, you ask uh, a writer or an artist who's more important. <laughs> and also another big fight is between the um, penciler and the inker. Because the penciler's lines are very fluid and beautiful. And the inker also has to have his own style when they come in and do the inking. But if they screw up the penciling, they want to kill them. So um, I, I'm lucky because I did a lot of comic books, so I know that I know each phase. So doing a graphic novel, I kind of follow the same forms. Also, I mean, I think of the of the graphic novel the separation in, in a graphic novel. <laughs> If there can be one drawn, is that um, you have you have more of an auteur, like somebody who writes and draws and does all those pieces, and it's not all broken in in, in that way. And that that's one of the nice things. About graphic novel. I was trying to like find it's it's so difficult because even graphic novels like a kind of a funny word uh, for it. We haven't found exactly how to describe it. But um, I was thinking, you know, if comics, mainstream comics, are are uh, escapist literature, then then. The graphic novel, the ones I like, are, are embracist literature. Because it's more like, I'll take that depressing thing and talk about it, and so I'm an embracist. But it's true what you say, Peter, is that the story, the beginning, middle, end, and twist, is really so important before anything. You really have to have that down, because a lot of the kids that I teach, they have these great pages, page after page of beautiful drawings. And the story just doesn't tie together. So you really have to have the story. And the other thing is the writing. They write really, really tiny. But you have to really be able to read it. So those those little things really, really mean a lot. Um, your question made me curious about something to ask me real quick. Um, you did your graphic novel under a special set of circumstances. Um, 
do you think you'll use the, the comments form again for, for telling the story? Are you planning another project? Um, yeah, I'm looking at ideas right now. And what, one of my uh, motivations for doing more is to not forget what it took me such a long time to learn. <laughs> because I had to work with Adobe Creative Suites. I'm not a technical person. I can't really jump into something like that intuitively. And so everything that I learned, I'm just I'm desperate to hold on to that. Because, uh, I don't have that kind of brain. To, yeah. to have like to a lot of learning goes away if you don't use it, probably. Well, I mean, it's really remarkable looking at the work, how much it seems to me you got the language of comics in there, and you're not coming from that background. I mean, I've spent years and years studying and, you know, parsing out how it's, they're all put together, and it, you know, she's obviously just more intelligent than you. Clearly. <laughs> but that's, that's the conclusion I'm drawing, which is very quite upsetting. Yeah, what, uh, what are the, uh, I guess, opportunities as far as getting to market? There are none. <laughs> no, it's, it's, it's really difficult right now. Uh, if you want to be rich, do something else. <laughs> yeah, it's okay. <laughs> Sharpie pencil is good. Um, no, I'm, when I came into the field, there was like, there was pretty much no field in the alternative comics that I was interested in doing. In fact, we had to self-publish in order to get that out there. And I'm feeling a return of aspects of that. Um, to the field because the, the um, publishing industry is collapsing in a lot of ways. But there's always, I mean, there's water flow, it has to flow somewhere, this whatever creative or, or these ideas are going to find uh, mediums to, um, so they will get out there in the world. And it just keeps shifting around. I mean, right now we're in a huge transitional place. But there are always different opportunities and sometimes there are people doing web comics or, or self-publishing, I mean, print on demand. But there's also, um, you know, and, and people do that and actually manage to make a career out of it. So there's always these different routes to go, but it's it's a scramble. I mean, being a freelancer is, is a kind of ongoing scramble. And self-publishing is a wonderful thing to do. When I started in comics, there were only two women uh, doing comics. It was male-dominated. 98% uh, of the readers were male. And uh, what happened with the with, uh, manga, it just opened up to women. So women in comics have become huge thing, which is very exciting. Um, well, thanks, Stephen. I'll let you ask your question, too, about there, because we're at the point where we need to, to, to wrap up. So uh, please don't uh, come up right uh, now and, and uh, talk to the creators, because they need to move outside to where they're going to be sitting and signing books. And uh, all of them can both talk and sign their name at the same time. I uh, appreciate sure that. Well, uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, so let's give a, a round of applause. For, uh,